I'm Dave Householder, blessed to be your Bible teacher. Turn to John chapter 20, if you would. We're going to look at John chapter 20 today. We are going through the book of Acts, and we're going to touch on the book of Acts a little bit. We're going verse by verse through the book of Acts, and our theme is Outward Bound for the entire year. But today, I want to talk about that one thing which we all experience. There are things that you can't unsee. There are things we don't want to see, and we see them, and we can't unsee them. There's, there's some things that are not real pleasant to look at, or very surprising, or shocking. And for the rest of our lives, that's like a tattoo on our brains. We can't unsee what we have seen. And we're going to talk about that today. When you see something, you can't unsee. And we're going to talk about how the resurrection of Jesus was something that his students, his disciples, could not unsee. You see, before the resurrection, this is from the life of Brian, the disciples were not the sharpest crayons out of the box, and they were flaky, and they would disappear, and they would say the craziest stuff to each other. Do you think he's the prime minister? I don't know. You ask him. I asked him last time. You know, there's that kind of stuff going on, and they're just clueless all the way through. And then they saw that one thing they couldn't unsee. They saw Jesus walking around after his crucifixion and eating with them and hanging out with them for 40 days. And afterwards, these Monty Python characters turned into New Zealand rugby players <laughs> doing their haka before the game. If you've never seen a haka before the rugby matches, all of a sudden they were filled with incredible power. Almost all of them went to their death. These Cowardly, strange, odd young men turned into these powerful apostles who turned the world upside down. So they went from this, had something they couldn't unsee, to this in no time. The book of Acts is obsessed with two things. This is the earliest church, and the earliest church was more like these New Zealand rugby players. Out they went. And the earliest church was obsessed with two things, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the main character of the book of Acts. Once you notice that, you trip over it. And the other thing is that they were lit up by the resurrection. In every single speech in the book of Acts, they said it was the resurrection that was pushing them, motivating them to their very last breath. They couldn't unsee it, and neither could you had you seen it. But so what if they've seen it? They say something. We haven't necessarily seen the living Christ walking around. Why should we take their word for it? Because they saw something they couldn't unsee. What does that mean for us? Let's look at John chapter 20, verses 11 and following. This is Mary Magdalene in the garden. She was the first one to see that thing you can't unsee. And she had a hard time believing it at first. Who here has seen something you said, did I just see that? And you have to ask somebody else, did I just see that? She had a hard time believing what she first saw. Mary Magdalene, Jesus was right over her shoulder, and she was about to see, the first person ever, to see that one thing that the disciples couldn't unsee. And she was called one of the disciples also, by the way. John 20, 11. Mary arrived back at the tomb, broken and sobbing. She souped to peer inside, and through her tears, she saw two angels in dazzling white robes sitting where Jesus' body had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. So Mary goes to the grave. Now, who here has been to someone's gravesite? Most everyone was in someone's gravesite. Now, if you went back to bring flowers on Memorial Day or whenever, and you saw that it had been dug up, what would be your first thought? Oh, good, he's living now. <laughs> you would be deeply troubled. Nowhere to put the flowers. There's the gravestone, and there's a big hole. And your loved one is missing. This is not good news to Mary. The one at his feet. Let's go to verse, uh, go to verse 13. Dear woman, why are you crying? They asked. Mary answered, they have taken away my Lord, my master, and I don't know where they've laid him. There's, 
guys standing there with white robes. Let me tell you something about angels. When people have encounters with angels in the Bible, they often can't tell whether it's a man, an angel, or God. And they actually sometimes use all three because it's confusing. They don't come with a name tag. They just show up, and there's this person by the, the grave. Verse 14, then she turned around to leave, and there was Jesus around back behind her shoulder, standing in front of her, but she didn't realize that it was him. He said to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Why are you, who are you looking for? Mary answered, thinking he was only the gardener. Sir, if you've taken his body somewhere else, tell me, and I will go and marry. Jesus interrupted her. He called her by name. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants to call you by name. And I'm going to give you some practical things you can do to listen for his voice so you can hear him say, Jeff, Karen, Amanda, Daryl. Jesus cautioned her. Mary, don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to God, my Father. And he's not only my Father and God, but now he's your father and your God. Now go to my brothers and tell them what I've told you, that I am ascending to my father, to your father, to my God, and to your God. Then Mary Magdalene left to inform the disciples of her encounter with Jesus. She saw something she couldn't unsee. I have seen the Lord, she told them, and she gave them his message. These are the speeches in the book of Acts where the people making the speech say, the reason I'm making the speech is because of something I couldn't unsee. They had seen the risen Lord. The last one, Paul, saw the risen Lord on the way to Damascus. Peter at Pentecost. Peter and John before the authorities. Stephen's speech before he's about to be executed by people throwing stones at him. Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul in Galatia making a speech to the Gentiles, saying, this is why I'm here, because of what I've seen. He saw it, it was so bright, it blinded him. Rece received his sight later on. James in Jerusalem saying, hey, since my brother, it was his brother, by the way, James, the brother of Jesus, since my brother came back and we saw him, so on and so forth. Paul in Athens, he's with a bunch of pagan intellectuals. And he says, because of something I have seen and I want to tell you about it, we need to discuss this whole life after death thing. Paul on trial says, I'm just on trial because I believe in the resurrection. The resurrection lit the people up in the book of Acts. They couldn't unsee what they had seen, and in 30 years they turned the world upside down. That, shall we say, let's see here, Super apostles turned the world upside down. The Roman Empire was never the same, and the world couldn't go back to the way it was and never did because of something they couldn't unsee. Truth is, we tend to avoid seeing things we, don't, we won't be able to unsee. Let me say that again. That's a lot of tongue twisting. We tend to avoid seeing things we won't be able to unsee. We were watching a murder mystery last night, and a ballerina was cut in half. They didn't show it exactly, like, gruesomely, but I had to look down. And Wendy always wonders why I can't watch these. I can't watch hospital shows at all. I, I, that, you know, the bells and whites are going off, and they're running around in the emergency room. I just, that's it. I need to go use the bathroom, go for a walk. But I don't want to see things I can't unsee. We tend to avoid seeing things we won't be able to unsee. And some people, subconsciously, avoid encounters with the risen Christ in their lives because we're afraid of what that might do to us. Subconsciously. I'm not saying we avoid Jesus. I'm just saying we avoid deep spiritual experience because it might mess with the way we think. We might lose control. We may not be in charge of our decisions. I have a bunch of experiences I can't unsee. I was at a Billy Graham crusade in 1983, and 
I thought the sermon was boring. I thought the music was boring. And then he made the invitation, and I blacked out. I was at the top of the stadium, and I came to two-thirds of the way down. I was walking down the stairs, and I got to the bottom, and I had no idea why I was there. And the Lord snatched me and brought me, without me seeing, down the stairs to the bottom. I had a guy named Cheon, a pastor from Pasadena, praying over me once. And it was like electricity going through my body. And I came to quite a bit later. I still don't know what happened exactly. I was in an African, an African hotel worker storefront church on the French Riviera once, and a bunch of Africans prayed over me, and a bunch of stuff happened I can't unexperience. I was at a Promise Keepers gathering in Atlanta, and the place lit 40,000 people. The place just lit up, and they lost control of the whole thing. And for another 40 minutes or so, people just were in piles of people praying over each other. And my prayer partner, Walter Jackson, and I were in the same pile. That's where we met. And we've been prayer partners ever since. And I can't explain what was going on. I can't unsee what I saw when the people up in front lost control of the Holy Spirit fell in such a way on the group that nobody was in charge anymore. You can't unsee that. My, sh my soccer shirt story, which I'll tell you sometime at length, there is no way I can unsee what happened to me that day. Ellis Tomberlin's healing. That's the first healing I experienced as a young pastor. I can't unsee him sitting in the lobby on the way out when he was supposed to be dead the night before. The mikveh in Israel, by far the strangest experience I've ever had, where I saw the light of the Holy Spirit in the water. Tim, John Ellis and Tim prayed over me just a few weeks ago at Alpha, and the presence of the Lord hit in such a way I cannot unexperience what happened when they were praying over me. To this day, I'm still trying to process pretty much all these things. And the truth is, you've probably got some things you can't unsee either. You've had some experiences that you can't unexperience. And we North Americans are not especially open to those things. We're a very pragmatic culture. We're good at rebuilding engines. We're good at rockets. We're good at a whole bunch of different things. We're not especially open to primary spiritual experience that we can't unsee. So, what do we do with this resurrection thing? I'm going to give you some practicalities. How to open yourself to permanently transformational experiences of the Lord. In other words, how to open yourself to tattoo-like experiences that you can't wash off, that you can't unsee and can't unexperience. Because just taking the disciples' word for it is one thing, but the reason the Bible's there is not so that we can just take their word for it, it's so that we can have the kind of experiences they've had. There's nothing they experienced that we can't experience. We can experience the presence of the Lord just like they did. We can experience his power just like they did. So how do we open ourselves up to those things? And if you do, two things will happen. First thing is, if you have a profound spiritual experience, one of those things you can't unsee, you'll realize that this world is not everything. There's something else behind the curtains. There's stuff going on that we can't fully explain and never will be able to our ordinary experience is never going to be enough to explain those things. There's another realm. Jesus called this realm the kingdom, and it's always there. God's power, how he's running things, how things are going in the spiritual realm. You get a little glimpse of that, and you realize that what we see and feel with our five senses is not everything. And the second thing that's going to happen is you're going to stop being afraid of authorities. Who crucified Jesus? It wasn't the Jews. It was the Romans. This was a Roman execution on a cross. Now, everybody, we need some government. We need law enforcement. But who thinks that it can become tyrannical occasionally and has in history and could happen any time? Where people start to run your lives and control everything you're doing. We're all one generation away from that. It can happen at any time. And the second thing the resurrection tells us, along with this world is not everything, is that 
for the tyrants and the politicians who do not mean well for us, their time is up. The Roman Empire was a monopoly on power in the world. For hundreds of years, they had no rivals. And what they said went. And they used brute force to enforce what they were doing. And that brute force, if you didn't pay attention, eventually it would be the cross. It would start with a fine, it would move to jail, and if that didn't work, they'd move to the cross. And they'll put you to death if, they, if you weren't going to toe the line. Jesus died that death and came back and said basically to tyrants, your time is up. Our God is more powerful than any government authority, any tyrant. This is why every dictator in the world, who do they first want to get rid of? Believers. Because believers will never accept them as being the total, complete, top authority. We'll never be able to do that. So those two things will happen. Governments are based on coercion and control, and eventually fear of death if you don't pay attention. But our New Zealand Hakka doing apostles who were playing rugby weren't afraid of that, and virtually all of them were willing to die for it at that point, realizing that Rome's authority was not total. So, practical things. Number one, open up your body posture. Here's something you'll never find in the Bible. Let's all pray, bow your head, and hold your hands. Not in the Bible. I think it was designed by a preschool teacher just to keep them from wiggling. <laughs> in the Bible, people generally prayed standing with their hands like this. That's how they prayed. Open body posture changes the way our receptivity works. If you sit here like this, okay, Lord, show me what you've got. And it's tough to have open body posture, and sometimes we're very inhibited about that. Some of you here, probably for the first time, see people raising their hands in worship, you think, what is going on in here? People are opening up their body posture. It's about receptivity. And that's one of the first things we can do when we're praying, is to open up our body posture. Get outside. I think one of the biggest challenges for Gen Z and some millennials, not all millennials, is that they've spent most of their alone time in front of a screen, unless they're sleeping. There's something magical about getting outside to see the magnificence of creation and the design of nature and how things work. It is amazing. We need to get outside more. Get outside, open your body, your body posture. Cultivate silence. I'm not real good at that. I like to play loud music a lot. And I've got my bus, and I fixed the speakers yesterday so that they're actually going to work even better. And you'll, you can hear me coming from a half block away because I'm playing some classic rock station, and I'm going down beach, and just boom, 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 boom. I like to have noise. I just do. I like to have music. And sometimes I get to the point where I'm so addicted to it that I get nervous when it's just quiet and me. We need to get comfortable with quiet and listening to God and praying in such a way that he can actually answer. Prayer is a two-way conversation. Who here loves it when you're, with, you're stuck, you're cornered by an over-talker? You know those people. They come up to you, and you just look for escape routes, and there's nowhere to go. And you nod, and you, your eyes glaze over. They pay no attention to any of your social cues, and you're trapped. And they go on for 40 minutes about why their uncle always bought a Buick. You know, and it, it just, it's awful. Don't be an over-talker with God. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Leave some space for him to answer you. Here's, who, who here has ever felt that you wish God would talk more and just doesn't answer you? Let's be honest. You felt that way? Try this one. This is what I do when I feel like God's not talking to me. Lord, what things did I do yesterday that I could do better? 
and it comes like movie credits. You have to tell it to stop because he will keep talking. Prime the pump with that one sometime, and you'll see that he will have plenty of stuff to tell you. Repeat after me. God has more talk when then we've got listen. He's got way more talk than we've got to listen. And we are such over-talkers with God in our prayers. And if we want to have an experience of God and to hear his voice, we need to listen for it. Lord, what can I do better? And oh boy, will it come. Hang around experiential people in person. People who don't just talk about theology, don't just talk about the Bible, but talk about their experiences with God. Hang around those people. And it's contagious. It's contagious. You'll start to get their mentality. Hang around people who hear from God. Hang around people who see visions. Hang around people who have those big experiences they can't explain. Ask them to tell you those stories. Because when you tell, ask you, ask them, I'm getting so excited, i got to slow down. <laughs> when you ask them to tell you those stories, you start to realize the mindset that it takes to receive those experiences. Those experiences aren't just for super Christians, they're for everybody. There's two kinds of Christians, receptive ones and less receptive ones. And the more receptive we are, the more we're going to hear God's voice and see his presence. Listen to supernatural testimonies and recognize your cultural bias. Now, you're not all Anglos. We've got lots of different ethnicities here. But if you're an, if you're an Anglo gringo, there's a chance that you've got a lot of resistance to spiritual experience, just culturally baked into you. And we have to unlearn some of that stuff. I run into Christians who argue actively against spiritual experience. I once heard a Christian say, God doesn't talk out loud anymore, we've got the Bible. If you want to hear God talk out loud, just read the Bible out loud. I'm thinking, so once the Bible got published, God just went on vacation and doesn't talk to us anymore? People, the Bible is not going to tell you some very important... The Bible's great for general stuff. Don't kill, reach the lost, feed the hungry. It's real good for that stuff. It's no good for specific stuff for your life. It never tells you who you're supposed to marry, where you're supposed to live, what your career's supposed to be, what you're supposed to do today. It's not in there. You need to hear from... Jesus. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. Tamara mentioned this morning in the prayer meeting. Mary recognized Jesus' voice when he said, Mary. And you'll recognize it too. It won't sound strange to you. I'm going to invite the worship team up. There is not a person in this room, or if you're watching all over the world right now, We've got people watching on several continents. There's not, a certain, there's not a single person listening to me for whom Jesus isn't right behind your shoulder wanting to call you by name and you won't be able to unsee it. Let's pray.